Hello? Ignacio, is Father Garantini connected? Ignacio, is Father Garantini connected under the name of Panelista? He might be. I, I don't know, but he's on. He's on. He's on now. Trying to say hello, hello. I'm trying. I I keep trying to connect, and they're saying that I'm not connected, or it's not. I'm not being let in. Yeah, but yes, but you are Father. Nilda, oh. could you please change the name of Father Garanzini? It is under panelista. And my and my video uh, won't start. It won't uh, it won't open because I'm not allowed. I see now more people, but I'm not able to join. No, it's it's me, Susana. Morning. Oh, okay. Just came here to check in. Uh, but Father Garanzini is at the end. Okay. Nilda. Buen dia, Leo. Yeah. She's ready. Nilda, ¿tú ves al Padre Garancini allí al final? Ah, ok, listo. It says, my, my message says, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Yeah, yeah, it's, we have not transmitted our uh, videos to Jet Father. We're waiting for, okay. for start the webinar. We can see you now. Morning, Father. You're ready okay, to begin morning. now. Okay. I was just checking everything was in order. I'll go out now. Good luck, everyone. Enjoy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Paco. Thank you. I see there is a light here over my head. Uh, it's, it's a halo. It's a, you it know. Like, you <laughs> see. The saints also have one. <laughs> Can you share it with us? I can share it. I can share it. Oh, yeah. Please. It's very easy to do, actually. I mean, I I, I mean the, the hello, not the light. That's what I mean. <laughs> like, I mean no, no, it's very easy. It's very easy. You have to put yourself in the right place. <laughs> I think I'm the only one without a video and I can't open it myself. Okay, thank you. Sylvia. Yeah, we have not met. Have we met? I don't think we have met. You're on mute. Mute. Sorry, I don't think I have the pleasure of having met you, Father, but nice no, to meet I you. No, I have not met you. Good to meet you. <laughs> yes, yeah, nice to meet you too. <laughs> And Stella, we have met. We have? I think we have met. You look so familiar to me. <laughs> Maybe it's the ear. Maybe it's the earrings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't think I have the pleasure of having met you, Father, but nice no, to meet you. No, I have not met you. I was, I was once interviewed Good. for Loyola College in, in Maryland. Okay. Once, 20 years ago. 20, okay. Well. 
Well, we are going to start the, the webinar. Hello, everybody. Good morning to those of you who are connected from North America, Latin America, East Asia, and South Asia. And good afternoon to our friends here in Europe and Africa and the Near East. Welcome. Welcome to you all, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Susana Di Trollio. I work for the Kircher Network here in Europe, and it will be a, my pleasure for me to moderate in this webinar today. This webinar, this, the title is The Challenges of the COVID Era for the Jesuit Higher Education. This global webinar is organized by the International Association of Jesuit University, AAGU, in collaboration with its six regional associations, AJCU in North America, AUSHAR in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Kircher Network in Europe and the Near East, AJCU Asia Pacific, AJCU Africa and Madagascar, GJSIA in South Asia. This inaugural conference of the is, is, this is the inaugural conference of the new project of the AJGU on best practice in Jesuit higher education. On behalf of my colleagues of the international committee that is coordinating the project, especially Ignacio Garrido, who is with us today. We want to thank all of the panelists for accepting the invitation to speak to us today. I also, I would like to thank the president of ITESO, the Jesuit University in Guadalajara, Mexico, Father Luis Arriaga, for allowing us to use the ITESO Zoom platform and for the excellent technical support that the ITESO team is giving us today. Our special thanks to Anilda Cordova and Leonora Lizarra, who are backstage managing the platform. For several months now, the disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic has posed, posed significant challenges for all areas of our Jesuit higher education institution, from teaching and learning, on-campus events, and community service activity, to the day-to-day -day management. In this webinar, we will focus on discuss these challenges, and especially how this crisis have, has affected the teaching and learning process in Jesuit university and college and their pursuit of an integral education. We have gathered an extraordinary panel of expert, experts on Jesuit higher education and on e-learning from around the world. We will listen to the panelists and at the end of the conference, we will have a question and answer section. So we invite you all to send your question during the webinar through the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screens. Please do, do not wait until the end of the webinar to post your question. Now I would like to introduce our speaker. For the introduction, we will have Father Michael Garanzini and Father Philip Geister. Father Garanzini is the Secretary for Higher Education of the Society of Jesus. When he began this job, Eight years ago, he was also the president of Loyola University, Chicago, which he, he, which he led for 12 years. Three years ago, Father Garanzini and the representative of the six regional association of Jesuit universities founded the AJU Association. This is a network that Father Garanzini will let until next year when Father Joseph Christie from India will take over. This year, Father Garanzini is also the president of the AJCU of North America. Professor Dr. Father Philip Geister is the president of the Kircher Network, which is the new association of Jesuit university and faculties in Europe and the Near East. Father Geister is one of the founders of this new network. He is also the founding president of the Newman Institute in Uppsala, Sweden, an institution that he has been leading since 2001. Father Geister holds a PhD in theology from Uppsala University in Sweden, and he also teaches systematic theology at the Newman Institute. So without further presentation, it is my pleasure, pleasure to give you Father Garanzini. Thank you, Father, to, for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, I want to thank you, Susanna, too, for putting this together. Um, it's an exciting uh, new venture, and I'm really pleased that it's gotten off to such a good start. 
And uh, I'm pleased really to, to express our appreciation, the International Association to you, to your team, uh, to Ignacio who's helped you, and uh, also to Iteso for all of their help in launching this uh, endeavor. So thank you all very, very much for this. Um, let's get right into this. I won't talk very long uh, because uh, I would think our panelists are really uh, very experienced people who really understand uh, are thinking about what's been happening to us uh, since we've entered this uh, COVID-19 era. Um, like all educational institutions around the world, uh, Jesuit institutions very quickly pivoted to an online format when they had to send their students home. Um, and like all the institutions around the world that have been able to do this, uh, we've learned quite a bit about uh, what COVID-19 is teaching us about delivering education in an online format. So now we know that it's possible for us to deliver everything that we wanna to deliver to, to uh, our students. Um, so that's been a real uh, benefit. And I think like most of you, if not all of you, you have been to many, many meetings online. You've had many, many encounters online and you realize there are many things we can do without leaving our homes or without leaving our classrooms or our offices. So there's, there's some real benefits. And I think people will talk on our panel, will talk about the benefits and we'll hear about them. And I think we shouldn't sell that short, but there's also been some challenges with this. Uh, for example, uh, I suspect we'll hear about the limits of online education. Uh, first of all, the physical limits when people do not have access. So that's a real, that's a real issue. Uh, there, is a, there is a divide, a gap between those with uh, resources uh, to online education and those without. And so we're seeing some both benefits, but we're also seeing some real drawbacks when those resources are not present. And the, the gap between the, those well off and those that are not well off has really hampered those without access to education. And that's something we're going to have to think about. Um, it, the uh, situation, COVID has also shown us that we're, we're threatened uh, financially. Uh, many, many, many students have taken some time off. Many students cannot uh, afford to continue right now um, as, as we've stretched into a yet another academic year. Uh, we see the, that some people just don't have the ability to uh, continue their education and, and some institutions therefore are financially strapped. In some parts of the world, we've seen the authorities, civil authorities that don't like the liberal education we're offering where there is freedom of speech and freedom of expression and exchange of thoughts and ideas and criticism, we've seen these regimes kind of crack, use the situation to crack down on institutions. So we have to watch that. There are several uh, places around the world where uh, the Jesuits have reported and the administrations have reported that there's some real challenges with local authority. Um, I, I think what I see at this point um, is the greatest impact may be on our mental health. Um, being isolated, uh, being unable to engage with your fellow students or your fellow faculty with, between administration and faculty, uh, it's really taking a toll. It's really, um, it, it really is quite grueling and quite difficult for some people to handle this much um, actual separation from colleagues and uh, the constant toll, especially where the, where the COVID has impacted the economy and the economy is now impacting the family. People are um, really becoming in some places quite desperate food insecurity, the ability to pay rent and keep up with your bills is really causing a lot of strain on people. And I think it's contributing to more mental health problems. Um, on the other hand, uh, another a side effect uh, is I've seen this now with not just the Jesuit organizations, but other um, academic institutions and other academic associations. There's more interest in collaborating as resources are, are stretched 
I see more people want to do things together, more institutions, more faculty want to do things together because it's sparked, there's sparked a lot of creative energy and a lot of creative interest in new ways of delivering education in new ways where institutions could be collaborating. I think we'll hear about someone I'm sure will mention the fact that we could be sharing courses very easily because everybody's online. And so there's, if we just figure out the mechanism to do that, we could be sharing a lot more of what we have across institutions. Because of this, uh, I would expect a leadership turnover. Um, I, I meet with um, a group of presidents, about 20 of them, uh, every other Friday for just a debrief. Um, it's really more like therapy for these presidents and rectors. They just, they can complain. They, they, you know, they, could, they could let their guard down the way they could not do that with their, uh, with their own officers, their own fellow administrators, because they're the leaders. And I've seen that uh, many of them are getting very tired. And I've talked with a few association presidents who have said that they've seen a lot of people talking about retiring, retiring faculty, retiring uh, leaders of institutions, because this has been a really long slug, a long haul to, um, to get through. Um, now that there's light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine, we'll see if these things change. But there's one thing I wanna end with that I think is the most critical issue and the, mo and the thing we should all be thinking about most, and that is how to help our students understand this experience and give it, giving them the necessary narrative, the necessary mental equipment to, to think about what's happening in their lives and what this COVID situation has taught us about our world. What I mean is this, this is the most impactful experience of those students that we are teaching now in our universities and that will be coming in the next four, five, six years, seven years, perhaps even more, even longer than that. As the most impactful experience, uh, we have to help them, I think, and perhaps learn from them first, but then help them shape the narrative of what this means about their outlook on the world and what to expect. The COVID situation has taught us how interconnected our world is. It's taught us quite a bit about how it has disproportionately affected the poor and the marginalized. It's taught us quite a bit about our interdependencies uh, internationally. And what we, if, if our job as Jesuit institutions is to create global citizens with a common good in mind uh, as, their, as their marching orders, help make a better world for everybody, not just the elites and not just those that are financially secure, et cetera. If, if that's our job, we have to help them shape this narrative because for many of them, they're going through it but by the time they get to university, they need to have in their minds an articulated um, rationale for what they went through and a vision for the future. And I think that's our real challenge now as this is proceeding, as the COVID situation is still with us, but especially as it, um, as it unfolds and as, as we leave the COVID situation and discover what is the new normal for our world. So I, I wanna leave you with that, these, these five reflections and then this key idea, I think that uh, it's, we need to think about shaping the narrative and shaping their consciousness about their role in the future. So thank you. And um, Suzanne, I'll pass this on back to you. Thank you, Father Garanzini. Philip, now is your turn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susanna, and thank you very much, Michael. Um, am I on camera now? Yes, uh, now it works. 
Uh, yes, I, I just want to extend my um, uh, well, my thank you, but also my welcome for, for, for the seminar on behalf of the Kirche Network. And as you've understood by now, the, the Kirche Network is the network of Jesuit higher education in Europe and, and Near East. It's uh, pretty young still. It was founded two years ago when IHAU was founded officially in Bilbao. Um, at this point, we are comprising about 30 institutions stretching all over Europe from Braga in Portugal to Moscow in, uh, on the north in Uppsala, where I'm located down to Beirut in, in Lebanon, very diverse a mixture of, of universities and schools of theology and philosophy and um, different um, institutions located at uh, secular universities. I would just briefly like to say a few words about this project where this seminar is, uh, which is seminar is starting. So the initiative of best practices in Jesuit higher education. The idea since we have all these networks now and so many institutions that are connected to it. So the idea is to use our networks more to, to learn from each other. So experiences made and knowledge gained in one part of the world can help to improve our practice and research in other parts of the world. And I think that's particularly true uh, during this global pandemic because we, we, sh we share the same experiences and we can learn so much from each other. Uh, we want to facilitate with this project the exchange of best practices and discuss how we better can live our mission as Jesuit institutions of higher education. And this is not only true about pedagogical exchange, but ideally it could also create a learning community comprising faculty and staff. So the first two topics that the project will address are pedagogical innovation and Ignatian pedagogy, which of course is so critical for the future of Jesuit higher education and which is such a central part of the mission of all of our institutions. So this project is organized by the Kircher Network, but it wants to engage all member institutions of IHAU. So we're more, be more to come. So, so, so check for, for follow-ups and, and please help us to fulfill this mission. So let me also say just a few personal words about this COVID-19 situations. I, I think, I still think, and I, as Michael always described, I haven't got beyond, come beyond this, this point that it seems very difficult still to see something positive with the um, situation we've ended up in. And even less in regard to what Jesuit education, education is about encounter exposure to new challenges with different people sharing with each other about learning communities. And the social distancing that has come with COVID is causing really the opposite for ourselves and for students and faculty and staff. It creates loneliness, it creates um, mental, uh, un uh, mental unhealth, it reduces learning to knowledge transfer, which I think is one of the really big challenges to Jesuit education. And it makes exposure to other people a potential risk to life and health, so we are supposed not to encounter each other. So at the first glance, it is a difficult um, challenge to, to try to find something uh, positive, to find, to find consolation thinking of COVID-19 and its effects on Jesuit pedagogy and of uh, higher education at large. But then, deeping perhaps a little bit deeper, on the other hand, I think the, or at least one point of Jesuit education is to learn how to cope with seemingly hopeless situations or rather to regard situations that we experience as challenging, difficult, or even hopeless, and not as defeat, but as a call from God. And, and today's webinar will explore this question. How can we regard COVID not only as a threat, but as an invitation for change, as an invitation to discover things that we haven't seen before, and also, as, as Michael already indicated, um, how can what we experience now uh, change the way how we approach the future? So how can we find consolation in a situation that right now, at least, at least for me, uh, causes so much desolation? And let me also just add a, a personal and personal thought um, and uh, uh, an insight that often strikes me in these times of Zoom that I have thought of very much during the times of Zoom. 
I guess that one of the remaining memories of the times of COVID will be that we had to look at ourselves all the time on the screen. First of all, where we most of the time are presented in a very unflattering way. We are alone, distant from each other and having to look at ourselves as we are. This is um, for me at least a horrible experience, but I think it reminds in some way of the spiritual exercises. The camera that films us may be a small symbol for the willingness to look at ourselves as we are doing in the spiritual exercises. And the spiritual exercises teach us about our humanity in a deeper and in a different way than a formal education ever can do. So the isolation that comes with COVID, the experience of being exposed and threatened offers, I think, from an Ignatian perspective also a privileged perspective for learning. Of course, I mean, there's, there are a lot of caveats, but I think we, we, it might be worth to look at that opportunity also. For some at least, the COVID-induced isolation offers a relative abundance of time, uh, which is a prerequisite for serious studies. And in the same way, uh, as time in the spiritual exercises is a pre prerequisite for serious Perhaps something positive in all of this, COVID-19 can teach us to overcome the problems, to overcome the problems that information technology has caused in form of enormous distraction, while at the same time liberating the opportunities of this technology to deepen our learning and to help us growing together even over geographical distance. So this is a little personal thought in the beginning, and I am just very much looking forward to seminars as it will help us to shed some light on all these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Now we're going to listen to our four panelists. The third panelist is Father Mark Bosco. He's the Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Georgetown University in Washington, DC where he leads a diverse interfaith campus ministry team and offers faculty seminar on Ignatian pedagogy and the Jesuit heritage of the university. He also teaches in the Department of English and Theology at Georgetown University. And Father Bosco is also the co-producer and co-director of the award-winning documentary film on the writer Flannery O'Connor which will be the national broadcaster in the United States on the PBS series American master in, er, in, the, in the early next year. So Father Bosco, thank you for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Susanna and, and uh, Father Philip and Father Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and to share a few thoughts. Um, and um, I think the first thing I would wanna say is uh, kind of going off what Father Philip said, just the experience of, of having to um, move uh, our educational project on online and to a virtual mode. It's, uh, I, I, I think I was talking to some of my Jesuit brothers and we thought that in, at least from May to, to March to May, we thought there was a bit of an adventure to it, right? How do we, how do we translate our courses into some kind of pedagogical, you know, uh, paradigms for, for this? Um, and, and I think the word today we would say is endurance and fatigue. Our students are telling that uh, us that um, we're talking about it uh, as faculty that we're fatigued um, and so we really it's, it's kind of a prayer for enduring this moment uh, even with the light at the end of the tunnel with vaccines um, but I do feel that I do feel the the, the strain that uh, Father Philip and both Father and Father Mike um, have suggested in their opening remarks. I think one of the things about um, about the pandemic is that at least in the United States and especially in the political capital of the United States where Georgetown is, it was not only just a pandemic, but there were other cultural things going on too. We had an election going on all through our fall, fall semester. We have the experience of the murder of, of African-American men, especially, but also women in, in the Black Lives Matter movement kind of engaged during a pandemic. So. So trying to grapple with questions of social justice uh, uh, and the common good in the midst of a pandemic 
having to deal with an election in the midst of a pandemic also kind of um, weighed on us uh, perhaps in a more profound way in, in Georgetown, but I think throughout the entire United States. Um, I think that most of what I've um, had, the, I guess the hardest in thing to endure was that there are, there are a lot, of, there are 28, to, um, if you count Canada, there's 28 universities in the North America or even maybe 29, but um, they all had a different response on how they could uh, uh, create this semester. Uh, uh, uh. So some of some schools were, everybody was back and they were doing virtual learning, but they were living on campus with some kind of formative moments. Others like my own university, Georgetown, it was all virtual and we only had basically the most vulnerable students about 490 students, most vulnerable students who really could not have a stable home uh, or stable uh, Wi-Fi to, to do this. And so we brought them. And so managing the expectations of both our faculty and our students who said, well, look what's going on at another Jesuit school where my sister is, or look what's going on at this part. And that, so that, that sense of always having to manage expectations uh, with com comparisons, and then managing the expectations of what is a what is an A? What is a what is a good grade? What's a, what's a, what's an average grade? Uh, trying to figure out ways in which to give uh, more leeway, more uh, a, a sense of, of the texture to to this moment in life. Um, so that was kind of that. That's from my own experience of just how it's been difficult um, and a kind of an endurance. I have to say that given the fact that there looks like there's vaccines on the horizon, it at least gives us a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, and the weight of the, uh, the burden seems to be a little bit less, even though my, my university is still gonna be all virtual in the spring uh, with just maybe the senior, well, the senior class, about a thousand students to 1500 students tops out of 10,000 undergrads. What were the tasks then of, of the last eight months uh, that I feel were really important to Jesuit education? We immediately thought, how do we match and integrate instructional continuity with spiritual continuity or formational continuity? Is there a way to move just from here's your courses, here's, here's you know, the production of knowledge to how do we keep connected? How do we make those, those gestures? And so spiritual continuity kind of became a, a, a word that we used constantly over the last eight months. What did that mean? It meant First of all, getting our, our liturgies, our, uh, our worship services streamed on Facebook and YouTube. It meant that we would have the Sunday liturgy that students and alumni and faculty could, could zoom into. It meant that uh, rabbi, uh, our rabbi, which uh, we are, uh, Georgetown has a very um, uh, uh, rich interfaith community uh, of, of chaplains uh, and, and centers of uh, intellectual engagement. Uh, between Muslim Christians, between uh, uh, Jewish civilization. Um, uh, we have a Dharmic community. So they began to stream and YouTube, do on YouTube their own kinds of um, uh, worship services. Um, so I think that was the first thing we tried to do within the first week. And it really actually had a great impact um, we, you know, we had for our Easter ceremony in our chapel, there were only 10 people in the, you know, in the uh, church, but we had 26,000 alumni and faculty and, uh, and students watching it because we could kind of keep track, as you know, on, on these virtual platforms. So there was something that it was, a, it was a connection. It was a way to reach out. So that I think was one of the most important things we did quickly. I'd say that um, I've spent, that the task was to spend some time with Zoom chats outside of the classroom. So I teach two classes and I, I think I've spent as much time out of the hour and a half or the two hour uh, seminar moment and little 20 minute, 30 minute kinds of things with students who I just wanted to make sure that they were okay or that they could set up a time and, uh, and, and talk to me or talk to staff or talk to other faculty. So creating those other spaces in the world, the virtual world, I think was a way for us to, to try to stay connected. I mentioned the vulner vulnerable students, uh, creating um, places, as Father Garanzini said about just wellness and health. There is a real burden, and especially if you don't have the means uh, to have a good, a, a, a large place to live, uh, a stable place, a place that is, you know, you can really work. Um, and so that's been a real, a real question of how do we take care of those students who are really at the margins of our schools um, and put them at the center. 
many different ways to do it. We brought, like I said, some students back on campus. We also had perhaps student affairs folks in our schools reach out uh, to certain school students that were around the world. We even said to our international students over the spring, you know, it might be hard for you to get back in the country because of, of COVID. So do you want to find a place to live or we can offer you some space here on campus so that you don't have to leave the country to come back and, and, and do that. So that was, that's been something too. Um, and then finally, well, two other last things I would say on terms of tasks is we tried to start doing virtual retreats. And these retreats would be like, for students, they would be like a, a weekend of maybe two hours with break, two hours with break on a Friday, two hours with break on a Saturday. But it was really um, uh, done by our juniors and seniors who would be <coughs> freshmen and sophomore. And the idea was, is that the juniors and seniors could say, listen, you're, you're, you're part of the university, you're part of the school. Um, here's a way to kind of set your moral compass in the midst of, of, of COVID. Uh, this is what we're going to have for you when you come back to campus. And so those virtual retreats, I had to admit, maybe it was my kind of Jesuit training, a little bit of a skeptic that that was going to work online. Um, but I have to say that I've gotten really good feedback from students, especially, uh, who said, you know what, I've never been on campus because of COVID as a freshman, but I've made nine friends on this retreat uh, virtually, and I can't wait to meet them. So that was one thing. And the other thing is about what we do with faculty is we, we try to do a one hour examen. And we did it with faculty and staff at different units and departments. And we call it basically a, a, an examen on the human face in the time of Zoom. And uh, we talked about the fact, and we, and we led this exam as we see so many faces on Zoom and we see them kind of abstracted from bodies, abstracted from, from context and locations. And so we just thought about how is the face also an image of God? And can, it, can and so this one hour exam really talked about how does, how, what does the face of God look like and how can Zoom how can we prepare ourselves to do that? And I have to say again, I think it's uh, it's 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 been well received. It's just a way really to connect with our faculty and staff to remind them that they're at a Jesuit institution uh, that that really is trying to engage at that deeper level. Um, Finally, we talked about pedagogy, and you've mentioned that pedag how do we how do we talk? And so, best practices kinds of, of zooms between faculty has been have been occurring all eight months uh, with uh, some of the centers that we rerun here. What are the best practices for Ignatian pedagogy? How do you do reflection? How do you talk about context? How do you talk about what kind of action you can take? How do you think about yourself uh, serving the common good? The last thing I would say um, is kind of what we would what we would keep. What are the pluses of 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 this experience? And um, I would say first of all, we're going to keep virtual office hours with students that's, and faculty. Virtual office hours really works well, so that's that's definitely staying on the books. I think the other thing is is this idea of collaboration, though. I've been part of, uh, Georgetown has run a, a collaborative conference, a seminar with Oxford's Campion Hall. Uh, we've run it with uh, the Vatican, with Cardinal Turkson's office uh, congregation. And so what, what would have taken a lot of time and effort to bring Cardinal Turkson here or for us to go to Oxford uh, for uh, a day long seminar, we could actually accomplish uh, through uh, through these webinars. And so I think the webinar, it's, uh, it's not going to take the place of conferences and being in front of people, but I do think it will, um, I do think that this is a, another way that we will connect, especially when it's, when we don't have a lot of funding, to be honest with you. What was so great about some of these webinars is it really didn't, it, the cost of travel, the cost of those things, we could kind of uh, make sure that we were financially uh, be, taking care of ourselves there. Um, and then finally, um, I would say that I, I think I've been talking to a lot of faculty and the, the idea of, of a hybrid within a regular um, course that where you meet, there might be two asynchronous lectures that you Zoom record uh, in a semester. Uh, or it, what I found when I was teaching online with students and I couldn't, that because of the time and I could see that the kids were kind of like fatiguing out, I would stop the lecture and say, you know what, I'm gonna put the rest of this on, on, on record this online please watch this before the next class. And so there was a real sense that um, it gave us a, a, few, um, a few more strategies to engage our students. So I think most of all, I, I would finish by just saying, 
I have found that students, whether they're in need or whether they have, you know, they do have a, a great care already taking care of them. Um, there's a stoic resilience to them. Um, uh, one of my students even said, who was, they, they were reading about stoicism in a philosophy class here at Georgetown online. And they said, that's me. <laughs> they said, I'm a stoic right now. I'm going to get through this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go straight through it. And so I do think I, I, I've been edified by the fact that, you know, these, these are 18 to 22 year olds, even our graduate students um, who, are, who are basically, they understand that there's an end game to this uh, and they can get through it. So I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you what we've been uh, trying to do here at Georgetown. Uh, and I think I, it, it resonates certainly probably with a few more of our, our American and North American schools. So thank you. Thank you, Father Bosco. Now I would like to introduce you as Dr. Stella Porter, who, who is the leading specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, DC. She is leading an initiative that is helping a school and university in Latin America and the Caribbean to use e-learning and move their courses online. Dr. Portal holds a PhD in computer science and a master in distance education from University of Maryland, when which, which, when which also was uh, the director of the master of distance education and e-learning uh, and e-learning master. Dr. Porter is a friend of us. She actually is a, a graduate from the Pontifical University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So she is part of our global nation community. Uh, Stella, thank you for accepting this in invitation and the floor is yours. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, Susanna. Let me just make sure that um, you can see my screen. Is that yes, all right? Stella. Yes. yes. Thank you so much for your invitation. Um, yes, I, I, I was telling a friend yesterday, I come from a, a long um, story with, with Jesuits. Actually, my entire, my entire education, the higher ed education uh, has been done um, in the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio. <clears throat> but what, I, what I'm bringing today um, to this conversation is actually a mix of um, my background that I developed here in the US uh, when I came in the year 2000, that I joined University of Maryland University College, which is now University of Maryland uh, Global Campus. And I was there for 13 years. And I kind of, um, during that experience, transformed myself into a person that e-learning is my life. Um, and actually <clears throat> this is the experience that that brought me to the bank. In the bank, I work in the knowledge area delivering online learning. So this, um, this the event this year, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the event this year that is being told until now as this um, impact and kind of very sad for, for many people to be moving to online education I come from a view of someone who was in online education, doing online education, but online education did not mean that people couldn't see anybody. So it, it, it's a little bit sad to sometimes online education in this moment being seen as, well, if I'm in the online, I can't see anybody anywhere else in my life. And I hope that in, when we get through this, what will remain is a view of the potential of online education um, and not that online means this, uh, that you can't do, you can't be with your family and you can't meet people uh, for coffee. So my perspective here today is to try to actually bring in, discuss uh, um, something that has been in the minds of many of the institutions working in online learning, which now is kind of placed uh, at the shores or was already in the shores of many institutions and that this year became cert, uh, suddenly urgent. And I would compare, um, this is my next slide. I would compare that a lot of what I'm gonna say today already existed sort of in the backdrop for, for some institutions. And then this year it, it transformed itself not into like a tide that was coming, but into a, a tsunami of an urgent change and we have to do something. And the need 
for these abrupt changes without enough preparation is what actually has um, made this so, so difficult. And as I started um, thinking about the conversation today, I went back to something that was talked about um, in distance education for a long time. Um, and it was this, what we have called, and sometimes in the literature, the iron triangle. And the iron triangle um, is actually this, this tension that exists between access, quality, and cost. And for many institutions doing distance education for, um, for all their lives, this has always been sort of at the forefront of all the decisions, of strategic decisions, of decisions big and small, even in terms of policies at a, at a um, state level, as well as institutional level and departmental level. And it's this tension that since online education has always been considered as a way to provide access to those who didn't have access to normal, a traditional face-to-face -face education. There was a tension there. Okay, so how do I do that with quality and with uh, affordable, uh, with, with a, um, uh, affordable cost, right? And we saw that there was this tension that if I gave access to so many that might have an effect on quality, I would reduce quality. We're talking about lots of students and this might also, how do I then maintain quality and at the same time I make this affordable. So this tension and, and if those who wanna read about this from the writings some decades back, uh, Sir John Daniels was one that used to mention this, this, this tension there. What I find interesting is that in, in, the, in the early years of online education, technology was seen as this disruption, that this, this disruption would come in and kind of solve the problem of, of this equilibrium of this triangle. And, and it did in many ways uh, when we had MOOCs being created and other innovations that were based in technology, we saw that, okay, here's, here's something that technology is bringing to us and can actually uh, make this work better. Okay, we can keep quality. We're learning about new pedagogies and how to give good quality education to more people at an affordable cost. The, the fact was that we were always uh, dealing with an audience that was choosing that kind of education or at least going to that kind of education because it was an answer to a specific need. A specific need, well, I either for convenience or I can't be in a traditional realm. So this is an answer for me. And as time passed, we saw that technology becoming so part of our society, a lot of the pedagogy that was discussed in online learning became part of what many of the traditional institutions were doing. So institutions started having their, maybe their small programs in, in online learning, and they have, you know, they had this whole universe. We didn't, uh, we weren't faced with what happened this year, which was this entire new audience who did not choose. They were not the non-traditional student. They were that student that maybe wanted the face-to-face -face experience and faculty who also valued and wanted to have the face-to-face -face experience suddenly faced with having to do that and there is no way out. So it's a very different situation which I think is limited in time. I don't foresee ourselves being in this situation forever, but this disruption that happened this year, I wanna be an optimist, will bring certain things in as we move forward with even the traditional modes. One of the projects that we advanced this year in the bank because of our experience with online learning was a big project called Moving Online where we just focused on helping people do exactly that, move online. And what we learned is that this disruption as, as, as the word crises uh, is, is represent growth, 
this disruption has also made many of those who are in the tradition in the traditional mode of learning the face to face question their modes it doesn't mean that because they were face to face they were doing something that was of higher quality all that that tension always existed so my my discussion here is that this triangle now is present for everyone that wants to look forward in terms of the role and the impact of technology in teaching. And I do think that as society moves forward and uh, digital technologies are part of society, there is also an obligation of taking this this crises and, and moving forward with a sense that how can I find a role for technology in a way that I find a balance and that's why I've, I've been calling this conversation a balancing act of access quality and cost. It is always going to be attention and the paradox I have found as I start thinking of this is that technology has become so much part of society that in, in, the, in the first look at the triangle, you believe that technology is gonna be an answer to the balance of the triangle, but suddenly we become so dependent on technology that actually these sides could be looked at the, the access to technology, the quality of technology, and the cost of technology. And we're back to the same tension that we had before. So instead of technology being a disruptive that is going to help us balance the triangle, we are now dependent. And I don't see really a way out of that because automation is part of our world. So there isn't this way, well, I don't wanna be part of that because we even need to prepare students to be part of a world where technology is there, that this tension needs to be considered at all times. And it is a balancing act that doesn't have one single answer for one single institution. It is going to depend on student needs and what it means to have quality and, and where you stand in the world. So this is one triangle that I think is gonna be very, very present. The other triangle that I, that I didn't have in mind um, when I actually wrote about Iron Triangle in 2012 uh, and talking how we could use technology to, to disrupt the tension, I started thinking of the focus of the Jesuit education and I suddenly found myself looking at this other triangle that is also uh, has a lot of tension and that in this initiative that we had with moving online, I heard many, many people talking about and I heard here uh, from the previous presenters, this tension of what do we want to talk about in our learning experiences? Do we want to really prepare students to come out of the gate and be ready to work? Or maybe no, maybe we need some space for them to give some, spe some steps back. And we need to talk about empathy. Empathy became such a word. I mean, in everything we did this year with institutions in moving online, we always heard people, we need empathy, empathy with students, empathy with faculty, with their own difficulty in learning and, and being vulnerable in face of the use of technology. So I saw these three elements around learning that, and I, and I see a tension there because Education is needed for so many things that we that develop curriculum and that how we what we focus even within the classroom in our decisions as administrators, what is our focus and so how to make this equilibrium of actually preparing people for the real world, that they're ready with skills, 21st century skills. At the same time, they have space in their lives for personal growth. And at the same time, we saw this, you know, with the comments about the election this year, the importance of critical thinking, of dealing with so much information, of filtering information. Those things are not related necessarily to the topic of I don't know, history 101, oh, biology uh, 301, uh, but it needs to be there. 
So I think moving forward, these two triangles for me really encapsulate some decisions related to these tensions that uh, educational institutions, all of them face in, in preparing students for the world, being part of this world connected to what's happening and also using this, what happened this year moving forward and to increasing opportunity, increasing access uh, with uh, quality education. Thank you, Stella, for, for being with us today and for your excellent presentation. Now, from Latin America, we will listen to Professor Sylvia Smerker. She is the Academic Provost of the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. Prior to that, she chaired the Governing Board of the Mexico National Institute for Evaluation of Education. Also, she was the head of the Research Institute for Development of Education at the Iberoamericana University. Professor Schmerker holds a Master in Educational Research and Development, and she has an honorary PhD from the University of Autonoma de Baja California, an honorary Doctor of Law from Concordia University in Canada. She chaired the governing board of the Center for Educational Research and Innovation of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Sylvia, thank you for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much and good morning to all and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to participate in this very, very interesting seminar. Uh, I would like uh, to talk about the, the theme of this uh, webinar, the challenges of, for the future of Jesuit higher education from the view of uh, Iberoamericana University in Mexico City. Uh, Cynthia, we, excuse me, please. Could you please uh, turn your screen wide so we can? I, I, I can't because that the, the option of configuration is no longer visible. Okay, uh, okay. I can't do that. Can you see we it can, anyway? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, the Iberoamericana University before the pandemic, when the pandemic started, we had already been transforming our undergraduate programs in order to better respond to our changing contexts to our educational philosophy and to the apostolic preferences. Uh, and some of these changes I think are particularly important for the post pandemic era. The first was to transversalize three main themes, some of which are sustainability, which I think now is more important than ever, interculturality, which uh, this uh, global experience is helping us develop, and gender equality, because we do have a very severe problem with uh, gender equality in our context and within our university also. Uh, another change was an interdisciplinary approach to the four common social humanistic subjects that are compulsory for all students at the undergraduate level. And now the approach is to have a problem that is looked upon from the different disciplines. Uh, also a trajectory or a track of social commitment uh, of the students with groups in vulnerable conditions throughout the four years of their undergraduate studies, beginning with information about inequality and about social problems. And then a first contact in the third or the fourth semester, which leads to indignation about inequalities and injustice. Uh, indignation pedagogy, uh, pedagogy was already mentioned. Uh, also the commitment from the fourth semester to the fifth or the fifth to the eighth semester with closures in each of the semester. And at the end, a reflection on the implications in personal life planning of what this uh, contact with vulnerable populations gave the students. Uh, we also had been working on the design of problem-based study programs, both undergraduate and graduate programs with an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, here we were using uh, as basic inspiration a three-year-old center on transdisciplinary studies for sustainability, which we already have at the university. And we developed proposals for programs that lead with inequality, looked at from different uh, disciplinary perspectives, migration, peace building, governance and democracy, and territorial studies with an emphasis on certain territories that are particularly uh, conflict-ridden in Mexico. Uh, what are we uh, thinking of uh, respect with, with regard to the future in the area of the formation of students? 
Uh, well, Ibero was not strong as many of our universities on remote teaching and learning, but it did have the infrastructure that allowed us to migrate to remote uh, operation in one week when the lockdown uh, was uh, imposed on us. And in this process, we discovered two things. We discovered what we can do remotely, what we can do through technology, but we also discovered what we are missing without face-to-face -face contact. Uh, so we think that one of the things that we can learn is that we can continue to rely on blended learning with things that have to do primarily with acquiring knowledge. Uh, we can strengthen our internalization, as many of you have already said, and diversification with technologies. Our aim for the next semester is that every subject has at least one session with a foreign professor or with someone external to the university from marginalized areas also. But we need to prioritize what we do face to face in order to ensure socially mediated learning, which is something that we have really missed, uh, dialogue, reflection, discussion, decisions that are taken after a dialogue, no, which have to be present in all of our courses. Of course, hands-on learning, uh, what, uh, what we have missed in laboratories and workshops. And I think above all, our practices and our social commitment activities, which have had to be carried out remotely, but as we know, it is never the same. It is never the same for the student. It is never the same for the vulnerable groups with whom we relate. And also we have to diversify, diversify and multiply group activities in uh, extracurricular uh, areas such as sport, art, recreation, spirituality, of course, and facilitate those that are proposed by the students. We have to listen to the students. They have wonderful proposals that do, do not occur to us as faculty. And we have to listen to them all the time to be able to facilitate those things that they think they need and that they are being, uh, they are, that are being proposed by them. Uh, we also have to continue to diversify our student population and to begin to diversify our faculty, which is something that we have not done. Uh, and when I speak about, about diversifying, I'm talking about uh, including different socioeconomic uh, origins, ethnic origins, special needs, foreigners, no? uh, in order to represent the diversity in the Mexican population within the university. I think this is something that's very important. Uh, regarding research, Three weeks after lockdown, Ibero made a call for research and action research projects on the effects of the pandemic. And this was made possible because there was already a very strong relationship with groups in vulnerable conditions. So we received 62 uh, proposals for research or action research projects. Uh, 35 of these were accepted with an investment of 450,000 US dollars uh, by Ibero University. And the projects had to do with all aspects of pandemic effects, with health, with education, with nutrition, with employment, with uh, and, and, uh, action research uh, involved, uh, small scale entrepreneurship, and also information. We did, we had a project that does monthly surveys on the effects of the, the pandemic on economic, social, and health uh, areas of the population. And this has been very important because actually there's no one else in Mexico that is doing follow-up studies on what the effects of the pandemic are. Uh, also during the last few years, Ibero has been increasing its research capacity. It has 150 faculty that are national research researchers nominated as such by the federal authorities. And we had already been prioritizing interdisciplinary research and uh, research that has potential for social transformation and for problem solution. And this will have to, we think, be strengthened in the future. We are also developing conceptual frameworks to begin discussions on the convenience of prioritizing in the future open science uh, to uh, make uh, uh, knowledge and information available and participatory action research that involves uh, intervention projects that transform reality. Uh, there are changes in the national research project uh, policy in Mexico that are punishing private universities. Someone spoke about uh, this question of uh, having uh, the government against what our universities are doing. So a new challenge is both uh, to generate and to raise more resources uh, on our own for doing research. And then of course we have uh, our outreach program, which is strong in our case, 
through its continuing education program and its relationship with small and social enterprises and capacity building in dealing with problems that affect the vulnerable, like such as violence, migration, disappearances, which we have a lot of unfortunately in Mexico, human rights violations and indigenous rights and in working together with social and popular organizations and their struggles against injustices in general. So this is very strong in our, in our university. And these not only have to continue, they have to be strengthened, they have to grow. And the biggest challenge I think that we have in front of us is to relate all of these outreach activities, uh, to relate them much more to the other two areas of formation and research because they tend to work on their own. And in summing up, I would just say that Ignatian philosophy, we think, calls on us to respond to contextual realities seeking social transformation for justice and peace. Uh, the reality was already unequal and just violating of human rights. And we have been trying to respond with knowledge generation, committed action, and some solutions. Uh, but the pandemic has made all of these worse and it will have lasting effects on poverty, on unemployment, and also on violence, we believe. And so we think that we are called on to respond, walking with the poor and to contribute to the transformation of the unjust structures of society, even more so today and in the foreseeable future. Uh, also discernment as a personal and an institutional strategy, both in formation and dy dynamically to better respond to the needs of our immediate environment and beyond our immediate environment. Uh, also, the magis, the constant improvement to revise our structures and organizations and eliminate barriers to ensure social impact, because in this transition, we have discovered a lot of structural barriers within our own organizations, especially in, in dealing with uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary projects. And prioritizing the human person, the, the cura personalis, to allow for an integral development. And uh, of course, this also has to do with uh, with the social emotional problems that have risen as a consequence of the pandemic. And this applies to our students, but it also applies to our personnel, to those with whom and for whom we work. And finally, I think for the future, higher education institutions will be different. In the post pandemic era, we will see the beginning of their transformation. I think that Jesuit universities have to be a part of this collective transformation of higher education institutions in general and of education as a whole. We have to learn from others also, but we think that uh, uh, higher education, the Jesuit higher education institutions can bring their charisma to bear on the profound renewal that higher education and education in general uh, is going to have in the near future. Uh, technology of course will reign as has been said already, but it will need to be complemented with human relationships. Uh, institutions will take advantage of technology and education will become more international. And this will, I think, uh, have an impact on global understanding and collaboration. And we have to sort of orient the use of technology towards that. Uh, a more profound commitment to the ever clearer need for social transformation and for sustainable ways of production and consumption will be a clear social demand. And as universities, we have to respond to that. Uh, the need to transition towards interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity will challenge the structures of our universities. We have seen it uh, uh, live in our own university. And all this will happen in the context of economic limitations that will probably follow the pandemic for at least a decade and will challenge, of course, our priorities. So those are the reflections that I wanted to share this morning with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Silvia, for your presentation. Now I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Javier No. He is the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Loyola Andalusia University here in Spain. Before working at the Loyola Andalusia University, he was the Vice President for Academic Affairs and also the Dean of the School of Communication at the Pontifical University of Salamanca in Spain. He holds a PhD in educational technology as well as master degree in computing science. Dr. No has been a full professor of educational technology and, and e-learning for almost 30 years. So Javier, thank you so much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Javier, please turn your, your microphone <laughs> off. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I'm trying to share my screen. So good morning for South and North American people. Uh, good afternoon for European people. Uh, and hello, everybody. I don't know the time in, in Asia. I highly appreciate uh, the invitation. Thank you for this opportunity. I, I think the, the previous reflection uh, I have to, to discuss for long hours, but uh, I, I'm going to present some, some other thoughts, uh, perhaps more theoretical than Sylvia does uh, just now. Uh, challenges uh, since COVID-19 pandemic began uh, are a lot, are numerous. So I try only to focus on the field that I am a little more closer to. Uh, teaching and learning environments and uh, their challenge. Uh, first, the pandemic has raised some issues in higher education that uh, were uh, already uh, under discussion. Say the last five or ten years, reports like Horizon Report or the community of Saping Edu uh, and a lot more think tanks and advancing uh, emerging trends in higher education. Uh, that were uh, already threatening higher education, think like, things like uh, unbundling or micro-credentials. Uh, we were, we were uh, speaking about blockchain, that kind of things. Uh, mainly in a structure uh, of business trends. And some other trends uh, are related to, to education, some to business, some other to campus concept uh, or to learning environments. I'm not going to talk, but let me, the minute, the second, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about a campus concept, but uh, it is changing and it's going to change more and more in the next years, you know. But uh, since we are speaking about possible change in pedagogy, innovation, trends, and new uses of technology, uh, I have to say that the boundaries between everyday life and learning uh, are continuously blurring. And um, pandemic has highlighted it. Uh, new spaces for interaction require new strategies or new approach, I think. How those trends impact our way of doing pedagogy? Here we have a uh, four well now Jesuit education or Ignatian uh, pedagogy models. The FOSI model of Jesuit education, the Ignatian pedagogy paradigm, the Ledesma Kolbenbach model in some higher uh, education institution, or even some core characteristics of the Ignatian spirituality that are, I think, are always in the way we think in education. How this new situation, COVID-19, uh, deal with those models or the way we think about education or pedagogy in Jesuit institutions. So as we are expert in other approaches, uh, I am thinking more in the way that technologies are shaping a new learning space, a new space for interaction where the Ignatian way will be facilitated or the opposite. I'm not thinking in e-learning or online learning. Stella Porto knows uh, about this a lot more than me. Uh, I'm thinking uh, in expanding the space where the interest in, in excuse me, the interactions will take part from now forward. 
So uh, regarding to innovation technologies uh, and disruptions, what is keeping us from, well, excuse me, uh, what is uh, keeping us, what is getting uh, us uh, apart from gymnasium pedagogy in your normal and what is helping us? We can analyze a bit through each of the models above, but the, I choose one of them. It's just one proposal to face the, the issue. Um, so uh, we have, have to say we have new spaces for interest. Uh, and during the COVID, we have enhanced the means we use to interact and we have catalyzed what in tech ed has been called a new, ge new generation digital learning environment. Uh, this is from the writings of Marco Brown in 2015 uh, to today. But, uh, the jump from 2015 uh, has been enormous, mainly in the last year. Today, the new digital environments surround all of our activity in higher education. And this includes artificial intelligence, second generation of social networks, analytics, adaptive technologies, machine learning, and a lot more with the risk and with their advantages. So uh, what I propose is to analyze each one of our characteristics is keeping us or is helping us. Well, for instance, uh, let's think about filters young people are using to communicate. I was going to uh, include here a picture uh, where I am a child or where I am a woman uh, in streaming uh, when I were speaking with my daughter. Uh, suddenly, she apply a filter and I change my, my face and my personality. Uh, perhaps uh, we are too aware of the risks. It's not only because of improved technology due to the pandemic usage, but also to advances in artificial intelligence. I have to say, uh, perhaps all this new generation digital learning environment is a matter of distance and representation. Distance has been broken 150 years ago. So we can see what we don't see. We can hear uh, the past. We can hear uh, the distance, in the distance, like uh, we can see and hear in that moment, and broken the means of uh, the measure of our senses is a challenge to education in that environment in the future. In the other side, the new environment facilitates in class in inclusion, universal design, access, is that I want to speak about, promoting consciousness of the diversity to our students. So analyze which part is heavier, uh, which part, uh, left part or right part, uh, which variables uh, are, uh, we, we can include in the right part or the left part of this categorization. Uh, I think will be, a uh, nice exercise we can do in universities uh, next months uh, and years. We have been forced with blended learning in a hurry, but for sure we will be able to use it better and better. But in the meanwhile, I have a reflection. If lot, lots of teachers hardly knew how to evaluate their students during pandemic times. 
last academic year without any student regroup, at least in Spain. I wonder if it could be because lectures replicate the didactic method that students recognize. On the other side, not only, is, uh, those are examples, no more than little examples, not only through obvious technologies such as simulation, but also values such as autonomy, residence, etc., will be enhanced using the excellent access that technology provides. And so we can analyze lots or lots of uh, variables in uh, one side and in the other side. A straight communication with people, uh, speaking about compassionate, straight communication with people you never would be able to tag with outside the virtual world. So we uh, as faculty can put in contact our students with people they weren't going to contact in their lives. Problem. And in terms of a uh, clean earth, in terms of taking care of our common home, uh, to what extent will be able to change the ecological mindset using appropriate blended learning? So uh, we are now uh, avoiding to waste, to, uh, excuse me, to waste a lot of fuel because we are in video conference. So uh, when we design the correct blender learning environment, we can, uh, we can communicate to our students that some things are better in face-to-face -face way but some others can uh, help to care, take care of our common home. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you so much for your presentation. Well, we have received so many questions from the participants. We have tried to summarize many of them into a few major inquiries. I will read the question and I will appreciate if each of the speaker and Father Garancini and Father, Father Geister uh, could please um, give a brief answer about your thoughts on this, uh, on this question. The first question uh, says, and I will read, at the present with the good news about the vaccines and when it seems to be a lie at the end of the pandemic, do you think that the changes brought or intensified by the coronavirus will require Jesuit university leaders to transform their institution, to rethink Jesuit higher education. Please, Father Garanzini, if you can start sharing your thoughts on this question. Uh, I, I think our panelists have done a great job in telling us about some of the things that I hope um, continue to develop uh, all the way from problem-centered, more problem-centered learning where students are more engaged to a really re real reflection on their spiritual health and their, their well-being and how they're doing. I, I hope that those things continue. And I think um, as several have said, what had already been in progress has just been speeded up. So I think there is. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges was mentioned, I, I think, by Sylvia, uh, that um, there's going to be a real challenge to the way our universities are structured. They're structured around disciplines. And the interdisciplinary approach to education, a problem-centered approach to education, this is where our young people really thrive. This is where they really enjoy learning. And I think that really is going to put some pressure on the institutions uh, to rethink how they offer courses and, and how we structure learning. Thank you, Father Garancini. Father Geister, would you yes, like to I, share your thoughts? I, I, I hope and I'm, I'm convinced that, that there will be kind of a rethinking uh, process after the 
the pandemic. I, I have to still think about what Stella said, but I think in the, the best of all possible worlds, we will um, keep what we have learned during this period of time, but also return to what was um, and, and, and deepen uh, the, the, the insight that, that we have gained now, and that is the importance of, of this personal encounter in education. So I think we, ideally we will not, we will um, draw the right consequences from the experiences, but also kind of return to what is needed in, in personal encounters. Thank you, Philip. Father Bosco, would you like to share your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I, I thought, I, I think it, as, as everyone has said, I think what we've done is we've put more tools in our portfolio for, for Ignatian pedagogy and teaching. I, I, I think we will return and we will, I think every student who graduates from a Jesuit uh, institution should have that course that is a professor with, with five or six people sitting around reading one book with a, with a book in your hand. There should be another class though that is, is, is with you and maybe the uh, folks at uh, a university in Brazil doing a class together. There should be another class in which it's just all about um, uh, writing. So I think the technology is just add, it doesn't just, we shouldn't be subtracting from, from ways we're thinking about the future. We're just adding another um, um, uh, technology to it. So wouldn't the education of the whole person really just be about this additional way so that we can even maybe, maybe assess, are students uh, viable? Are they, are they assessing well on, on, on these virtual platforms? But I think we also have to do the formative work of, of personal encounter with a text, uh, with a problem, so that that interdisciplinarity also happens with, with, with different kinds of technologies. Thank you, Mark. Stella, would you please have shared your thoughts, especially we appreciate your opinion because you are watching us from, from a, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, so I, my experience says, um, I've learned so much this year. You know, one, one of the things that I have uh, talked extensively with people inside and outside the bank is how much, even for those who have been in online education, all this experience has been changing. For ex I will say to you, for example, um, a, a sentence that I use all the time is that the history of, of, of distance education and online education is asynchronous. And this year, we were, I suddenly has had to say, okay, these Zoom meetings, okay, you can use them <laughs> because this was not part of any of the best practices of, of designing uh, classes. But I think there is, there is here what several are said, there is, uh, there is a place uh, uh, that we meet, right? So I think there is a, an extra value of being in person. So something that you took for granted of being in person with other people will have, have has a very different value. So we're not gonna use those moments to just have a, a teacher standing in front and talking. So I think if there's something good coming out of this is maybe rethinking education to be more student-centered and being more focused on the needs of students. The other thing that I, that I think is very, very critical is that many, uh, many countries and many places have realized how the digital divide is so, so deep. I heard from many teachers saying, I had no idea. I had no idea that my faculty and my students didn't have access to anything. So I think this is a huge call for a, a big change in terms of providing the means and making technology something, well, if you have water, running water in your house, well, maybe having access uh, in your house is also like, some, like having energy coming to your house. So I think, these elements are, are it, I think it's a big call for, for certain things that need to change and you can't wait. So I hope that call is not forgotten and placed in, in second place once again. Thank you, Stella. Silvia? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> well, I just, I, well, I wanted to look forward a bit to uh, the fact that, well, backwards to the fact that uh, higher university institutions in general have not been very efficient in solving the problems that we have today. 
And I think that is something that we need that has to really question us profoundly. I think Jesuit university, uh, higher education institutions are have these problems at the forefront and they have to like move forward to show the world how this is done, both informing the students to be able to face these problems and to contribute to their solutions and in generating knowledge uh, to be able to solve them better. But I think that our, our priorities there have to do with, a, at least from a Latin American outlook, our main problems have to do with our common home, with sustainability. I think we can't avoid looking at that as one of our main objectives. We really have to move forward towards the contribution of universities toward a more sustainable world. Next, inequality and injustice in general. I think this is something that we cannot allow because we are uh, called to work with the poor. So I think that this is something that also we have to look uh, very much into and we have to discover the ways that we have to uh, use pedagogy and use technology in order to be able to do this better. And third, in our case in, in Mexico and in many countries in Latin America, peace building. No, community building and peace building, which I think is also something that due to uh, disappearances and violations of human rights, et cetera, are at the forefront of what we have to be uh, dealing with. So uh, from a sociological perspective, I think that these are the calls that have to be made and we have to think uh, in terms of these problems, what do we do internally to be able to face? Them? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Celia. Javier? Well, uh, I think uh, universities has a uh, uh, great work to do in terms of structure, in terms of our organization, strategy, and all that, uh, to fight with the diversity, to fight uh, with the uh, social injustice. Uh, and I think uh, uh, technology can help if we uh, we are prepared to share more between institutions. I think uh, this is the opportunity uh, to make networks between universities. So uh, it's, it's, uh, perhaps uh, we, we can uh, access to other universities, to other, uh, to, to other problems in South America, in Africa, and so on. We are, uh, when we are uh, working in networks. Thank you, Javier. Actually, there have been so many questions about the role of Jesuit University facing all of these new challenges, especially the social challenges for underdeveloped country and uh, vulnerable groups. And I will try to summarize all of this question and the call for Jesuit University to do something about, about the future. Uh, one of the questions says, could AAU develop or a project or a, pro a platform for interdisciplinary courses where international students and faculty can address global topics such as healthcare, digital gap, reconciliation, social justice, sustainable development, and environment among other topics. I think it's clear the, the call for, for the role of Jesuit University to, to address this topic. So Father Garancini, if you please can answer that question. Well, uh, the, whoever asked those questions is, is uh, thinking, I think, correctly about the future of Jesuit education. We're preparing for an international summit when we when the pandemic allows us uh, to do that the the next big assembly we have a task force looking at the problem of global citizenship how do we prepare in all of our institutions global citizens as opposed to just simply civic citizens secondly we have a group that's looking at the problem of sustainability and how jesuit universities can be leaders in sustainable universities. Laudato Si Universities is actually a project that the Vatican has started and has handed to us. We have a group that's looking at migration and how we're going to be dealing with migration and the marginalized and how we're going to reach them. We have a group that's looking at the role of faith and, and how, how does the Jesuit University promote a faith 
that, that does justice. And we have a group that's looking at reconciliation and peace. Those will be the themes. Those are the strategic directions of what we'd like all Jesuit universities to be involved in in a serious way. And we'll be presenting all of the results of those various groups of faculty that are working on those issues to the leadership of the Jesuit universities in the next assembly, which is probably going to be a year from this summer. Thank you, Father. Well, given the time, maybe I'm going to read just one more question that is addressed, especially to on the issue of online education. And it says, are the AJU and its six regional associations planning to develop a project that helps Jesuit University and college to face to face the all and new challenges of online education that you mentioned on your speeches? Father Garanzini, if you uh, want to. Yeah, yes, exactly. Each of those task forces will be presenting a webinar during the, the, the year 2022. And what we're going to be asking our Jesuit universities to do our faculty is to tell us how that issue can be aided by online education and by the new technologies that are available. That'll be one of the questions embedded in each one of those. And the Ignatian pedagogical method is another issue that is promoted by technical uh, technology or, and is sometimes hindered by technology. So what are the challenges with each of those areas? If the institution is if, are to become more attuned to those global issues together, then how does the Ignatian pedagogical paradigm help us? And how, do, how does technology help us? Thank you, Father. Anyone else, one of the, the panel wants to, to share their thoughts on this question? Well, we have, we have uh, been working, uh, talking about one hour, one and a half. So I think this is uh, enough for, for today. Uh, on behalf of the of all of the group that are preparing the project on best practice in Jesuit education, and on behalf of the AJAU Association and the Kircher Network, I would like to thanks all of the panel and the speakers that were with us today, and also all the friends that connected to our webinar today in Zoom, we have uh, so far, we have more than 300 people connected on Zoom. The conference was also transmitted to YouTube, to the YouTube channel of the AJEU. We are trying to measure how many people are watching us from around the world. It, it has been a wonderful and a pleasure to listen to you all with your experience and your knowledge on this uh, challenge that Jesuit University and Fancy to today. Uh, really thank you for, for your participation and we look forward to continue working on this kind of organizing webinar, global webinar, a regional, a regional webinar where we can share all the experience and reflection on these major topics that are so critical for Jesuit higher education. So please take care of yourself, be safe, and good, God bless us on this difficult time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.